Chapter 210 Spanish Mommy Now that I was in CTF, which was the jail across the street from DC jail, I began to formulate plans for my return back to society. I thought a burden had been lifted with the gun charges being dismissed with my only worry being the parole board. But no, the government was seeking a new indictment. They were seeking to bring new charges. They were back in front of the grand jury arguing for a new case. While the Jaguar was at the impound lot, my investigator went to the car to recover some of my property like my fresh North Face coat, boxes of Face and Letters CD, the album that I recorded, Benny Lee's blue Eddie Bauer jacket, two cameras and business paperwork. But while the investigator was collecting the items, he stumbled up on some contraband. Over 2,000 ecstasy pills were in a bag that was stuffed in the trunk. The cop that assisted him to the car snatched a bag of pills from him and turned it over to the feds. My lawyer came to visit me and said, Kareem, they found a bunch of ecstasy pills in the trunk of your Jaguar. I don't know how they're going to do this, but the government is now seeking a federal indictment. I didn't panic. Jaguar? What Jaguar? I don't own a Jaguar. That car belongs to the government. It has been in their possession for over 16 months. That's their car. Those are their pills. Not mine's. She said they even subpoenaed my investigator to the grand jury to testify against me. I laughed. I mean, what is he going to say? That he found some ecstasy pills in a car that was in the government possession for almost a year and a half? This is a joke. She thought about it and laughed as well. You're right. And not only that, they can't force someone on your legal team to testify against you anyway. Unless you told them about a crime you plan on committing or you all committed a crime together. This won't stand. I'm filing a motion to squash the subpoena. The government was getting really pressed to keep me out of society and I was willing to fight the big bad wolf because deep inside, I thought I was a bigger and badder big bad wolf. I saw all of the judges and prosecutors as weirdos and squares. I saw all of the cops as unorthodox freaks, clowns and oddballs. They couldn't wash my all black tees. They couldn't even hold on to my old boxer briefs. But they saw me as ruthless, notorious, vicious and dangerous, menacing, threatening, unpredictable and treacherous. My lawyer saw me as sweet but stubborn, smart but passionate, wild but creative, gifted but crazy. I was ready for whatever battle that presented itself as the atmosphere became hazier and hazier. I was ready for anything that they came with. Then the story got crazier and crazier. One day I got called for a visit out of nowhere. It was unexpected. It was very rare that I got a visit in prison. I rarely got visits. Usually no one came to visit me. But a Spanish girl that I used to bus came to visit me one day at CTF. She said she had been looking for me for over a year and couldn't find me. She had no way to contact me because she didn't know any of my friends. But she finally put two and two together of where I was. She had just married a cop. They were engaged for six months and then got married in the past year. He must didn't know how much ecstasy she used to move. She said that he was always bragging about arresting this notorious guy from uptown. She said he used to be so happy and braggadocious about this arrest, but she usually dismissed it. He was a buffoon, but he paid the bills, so she would listen to his folk tales. 
Being a pig was the biggest excitement in his life. Being a human excrement was his biggest accomplishment and arresting men like me was his highlight. One day he was bragging again, but this time he described how pretty the jaguar was that he arrested this notorious guy in and how every cop wanted him off the street. But he was the one that actually got him off of the street. He was so happy and proud of himself. Once he said Jaguar, it sparked her interest. I was the only guy uptown at that time driving Jaguars. She asked, what color was the Jaguar? He said, green. That's when the light bulb went off. She then asked him, is he from Kennedy Street? His face froze up and he said, yeah, he's from Kennedy Street. Would you know him or something? He was already envious, but now the weirdo was feeling insecure. You know him? Please don't tell me you know him. Please. Where you know him from? She enjoyed seeing his fragile inflated ego deflated. She enjoyed seeing him stressed out because he acted like a tough guy. But she knew he was a square and he thought she was a square like him. She said, yeah, I know him. I used to date him. The pig head exploded. He jumped up off the couch, grabbed his head, fell against the wall, kicked the chair, threw his drink and stared at her for a long second. She said he looked like Wild E. Coyote, a straight doofus. She said she just stared at him like he was a certified idiot. You emotional worse than me. Why you doing all that? What do you mean why? You used to date those type of dudes? Yeah, so what? What's wrong with that? Oh no. Hell no. Hell no. Now I'm scared. I have to contact my captain and my supervisors. How could you not give me this type of information? Because I don't know who you are arresting in the streets. If you didn't keep bragging like a little bitch, I would have never known you arrested him. He stormed out of the house, leaving her and the baby. Damn. Oh shit, for real? Now my brain was in overdrive. The arrest and documents made no sense. They had an APB for two black males and a gray Jaguar that robbed a white woman in Georgetown. Snatched her pocketbook. But who was driving a Jaguar and snatching pocketbooks? It made no sense. I didn't believe it was any robbery. The pigs, snakes, and rats just needed to get me off of the streets. Somehow. The next day, the cop, her husband, told my judge that he feared for his life and told him the whole story of his wife dating me. He knew that I knew where he lived and through her, I would know where his whole family lived. He was seeking a protection order and planned on separating from her. My lawyer came back to visit me a week later and told me the motion she filed to squash the subpoena against my investigator that found the ecstasy pills was granted. And since they had no one to testify in front of a grand jury about the discovery of the pills, no indictment was possible. So I was good on that. Plus the case was dismissed because of a Fourth Amendment violation, so the pills would have been suppressed anyway. Damn idiots. She then said the judge also denied the pig's protection order, but issued a warrant for the Spanish girl. She was an immigrant that had been in the country since she was a baby, but her parents never completed the necessary paperwork to make her a citizen. The pig knew this, so he snitched on his own wife and mother of his child. She was now on the run. Damn. I still had to see the parole board to determine my release date and all of these complications would most likely be entered into the hearing. According to their guidelines, the most they could give me was 24 months. I was already in jail for 18. Chapter 211, Lost Years. 
I had a single man cell at CTF and once again the solitary gave me solace. I had time to think about my next moves. Did I want to continue on this foolish cycle of ins and outs of prison? Again my million dollar goal collapsed. Should I try once more? I was getting to my wits end with life. Instead of keep going in and out of prison, my plan was to do one or the other. Stay out or stay in. I needed to make my mind up. Constantly going in and out of this dark place was tearing up my brain cells. Jail was like a dark wet alley filled with stray cats and the funky smell of rotten fish. Mentally it was like a trash pit or a sewage plant. I was again wrestling with my thoughts and trying to figure out life. My nonchalant attitude towards freedom was costing me years. My dismissive attitude towards life was only bringing me wrinkles. My peace of mind was in pieces as I searched for peace from beneath the hoodie. It wasn't found in being a bully carrying pistol pieces or getting a piece of pussy. A naked woman was playing in her bushes with one hand while the other was rubbing on her cushions. I was in my window looking wishing I could touch her, but I couldn't. CTF had female inmates whose cell blocks were visible through my window. Their cells were directly across from mine and I could sit on my bunk and watch them twerk. I could watch them caress each other. I could watch them have sex with each other. Work. Every night this one girl would blink her cell lights to indicate to me that it was showtime. She told a female officer that she knew who I was and enjoyed entertaining me. I didn't know who she was, but I enjoyed her entertaining me. Every time she would blink her lights, I would think about what I've been reduced to. Staring at a naked woman through a jail window a hundred feet away. Masturbating to two naked women kissing through a jail peephole while making sure an officer doesn't catch me having sex with myself. Feeling like a pervert. Generate, a freak, deviant. Thinking how far could I fall because of bad decisions or catching humble cases. I carried a gun because the lifestyle I lived required it. I carried a gun because the places I frequented were sometimes frequented by people that were also in the lifestyle that I lived. And they also carried a gun. And we all were suspicious of one another. We had no trust for each other. We didn't even want anyone in our lifestyle to know where we lived. And if one of them found out, we would immediately move all the way across town, sometimes to the next state over. I carried a gun because America is a dangerous place and it averaged a hundred murders a day, every day, seven days a week. America averaged 30,000 murders a year. I had a legitimate reason to carry a gun. Everyone in America had a legitimate reason to carry the medal. America is the land of the marauder, the land of the devil, the land of the slaughter. The lifestyle that I chose required raw cash, which is a recipe for non-thinking sticker boys who couldn't figure a way to make their own money to scheme on your money or couldn't use their own brains to rob the financial system. The system that had all the real money. And the system that would give them a slap on the wrist if they used their brains to take it. But they would rather take from the hustlers. They would rather take from other gunmen. They would rather take from the killers. And most times end up getting killed. Brains splattered on a sidewalk. Body bent up like a pretzel. Survival depended on what side of the street you walked on. This Mossberg gave them niggas freckles. I was staring out the window wondering what she was thinking about as she spread her legs wide open and stuck her fingers in it. She was locked up like me, staring out of a jail window fantasizing like me, masturbating like me, humiliating herself like me. I had enough. I got away from the window and recomposed my mental. I picked up a pencil and silently admired my penmanship. I formulated poems, raps, and scripts. 
She was just a fantasy, but writing screenplays was my escape from this pit.